Thank you, Tracy. Well, as we are following our story, we're in chapter 6 today, but I want to back up uh, to chapter 5 to kind of remind us of, of where we're at. And chapter 5, verse 14, the last verse, this is where we left uh, our, our characters last week. Then uh, his wife, that's Haman's wife, Zeresh, and all his friends said to him, Let a gallows fifty cubits high be made, and in the morning tell the king to have Mordecai hanged upon it. Then go joyfully to the king and to the feast. And this idea pleased Haman, and he had the gallows made. So when we left our hero, Mordecai, we left him, so to speak, in the shadow of the gallows. You think about that. That's not a very good place to be in the shadow of the gallows. Uh, his, uh, he has uh, 24 hours to live. If Haman's plan uh, plays out the way he uh, anticipates that it will. Perhaps some of you feel like you're living in the shadow of the gallows. Uh, we all kind of go there from time to time. It seems to be part of life. Uh, but we don't like it. We don't enjoy it. But here is our friend Mordecai. Now, the thing we run into that really causes us consternation is that all through our story here, Mordecai has done everything right. Pretty much. He's lived his life as well as he could. Uh, he's, it's kind of a mundane existence, but it is what it is. Uh, there, he's a captive in a foreign land. He's making the best out of it. He seems to be, when God nudges him to do something, he seems to carry it out. He went to Esther and, and uh, convinced her to go to the king and all of those things. So, since he's doing everything right, should his life not be easy? We, we would like to think so, wouldn't we? I mean, don't we, when we do things right, expect it to work out for us? Of course we do. But what happens? Sometimes it doesn't, does it? And then to make matters worse, there's always a Haman hanging around. You remember Haman? He has done everything wrong. He, he's a jerk among jerks. He's prideful, full of himself. He doesn't care about anybody. Remember our, our verse we just read? When, when they told him to have uh, Mordecai hanged, he went away rejoicing and he's off to party with the king. And what's happening in, in his life? Everything's wonderful. He's the king second in command. The king has given him his ring. He's the most, second most powerful man in the world at that time. And he's just partying and having a good time. He's on the fast track to success. Why do the righteous suffer? And the unrighteous prosper? It's the age old question, isn't it? But, one thing we've learned as we've gone through Esther, things aren't always as they seem, and things don't always remain the way they are. Now, someone said, and I don't remember who it was, but they said, uh, if you're going through a real hard time right now, it's okay because this will end. Conversely, if you're going through a real good time right now, it's going to end too. Change is constant. So while Mordecai is living his life in the shadow of the gallows, Haman is, is living his life in the light of the sun. Everything for him is going well. Well, what about our heroine, uh, Queen Esther? What, what's happened to her? Well, you remember that she's gone to the king. Uh, she took that chance because to go to the king uninvited was to take the chance of losing your head. And she has begun to work this plan to get around to asking him to change his law, his decree that all the Jews will be killed. But in chapter 6, we don't hear from her. She's over here working her plan. Our two players today are Mordecai and Haman. Our question comes up again, where is God? He's not mentioned in chapter 6. Of course, he's not mentioned throughout the entire book. So where is he?
we know that he is here we know that he is working we know that he is unfolding his plan according to his good purpose in fact I would suggest to you that chapter 6 is a perfect case study in Romans 8 28 where we see God behind the scenes working all things together for good to his people to those that love him who are called according to his purpose you can't see him you can't feel him but he is there ever present bringing things together now that's the way we have it here with Mordecai he sees no evidence that God is working anywhere in his life in fact maybe just the opposite this gallows we talk about cubits doesn't mean too much to us but if you do the conversion that means it's 75 feet high it's it's a big deal it's going to be a circus it's going to be a great day don't you know that word has gotten around town of what's going on here and Mordecai surely knows so Mordecai looks around and he says I don't see any Red Sea parting I don't see any burning bush I don't hear any booming voice in fact I don't even hear a still small voice where is God I'm going to die and God doesn't care some of you have been there what we're going to see here in chapter 6 though we will see no overt miracles we will not even hear a still small verse voice what we're going to see is a series of coincidences and you remember what a coincidence is according to C.S. Lewis a coincidence is simply God's way of remaining anonymous his invisible hand is working we don't see it we don't feel it so we call it coincidence but it's kind of like if you're standing in your house and the winds blowing you don't see it you don't feel it but you can see the trees being bent so you know the wind is blowing that's how God is working here in chapter 6 so let's look and see now the first six verses that uh, Tracy read for us I want to point out a series of coincidences here and the first one is right here in the first part of the first sentence on that night the king could not sleep that's coincidence number one why on this particular night could the king not sleep well we can come up with all sorts of coincidental reasons but the bottom line is on this night the night before Mordecai is to be hanged the king can't sleep we have no indication that he was troubled there was no dream there was a no pending disaster in, in the, the the kingdom everything was well and yet on that night the king could not sleep we don't have to look very far to come to coincidence number two he could not sleep and he gave orders to bring the book of memorable deeds the Chronicles and they were read before the king now this is the king of Persia if he couldn't sleep he had all kinds of options he could have ordered up some food he could have ordered up some wine uh, we've already noted he has a, a, a well populated harem he could have called for some of his wives uh, he could have called for singers he could have called for many things but he asked for some bureaucrat to come read some chronicles of what's gone on in his country now is that what you would have done if you were in his position <laughs> well, it might but is that what you would have done out of all those options probably not coincidence he called for this book coincidence number three in verse two 
And it was found written how Mordecai had told about Bigthana and Teresh and how they had plotted to kill the king. Now, the king didn't specify from where in the Chronicles to read. Now, we're talking about a thick book here. Why did they happen to open to a place where they would read that particular passage? Coincidentally, God's not here. God's not working. We don't see God anywhere. They just happen to open to the part where Mordecai is responsible for saving the king's life. But there's no mention that Mordecai received any reward, is there? You remember the, if you've been with me through the series, you remember when this event took place. And, and we'll look here at verses 3 and 4 now. And the king said, what honor or distinction has been bestowed on Mordecai for this? Now you'll remember we talked about the importance of rewarding faithful acts by his, his citizenry. Uh, unfaithful acts were dealt with quickly. You usually, usually lost your head or worse. But, but acts of faithfulness were rewarded greatly because the king wanted to encourage those things. So he says, what did we do for Mordecai anyway? Did we, did we buy him a new house? Did we buy him a new car? Uh, what, what did we do? Did we give him a high position in government? What did we do for Mordecai? The king's young men who attended him said, Nothing has been done for Mordecai. And the king said, who is in the court? Now, Haman had just entered the court of the king's palace to speak to the king about having Mordecai hanged on the gallows. And he had prepared for, that he had prepared for him. There's no mention of the reward. Coincidence number four. The king asks, who is in the court? Now, if we, if we, we know the setting here, it's probably now early morning, maybe dawn. Uh, the king's been awake all night. He says, who is in the court? Because at this early hour, there wouldn't be many in the court. And who just coincidentally happens to be in the court? Haman. And why is Haman there? Well, Haman got up early because he wants to get there. He wants to be on. Because remember, he can't just barge into the king's presence either. He has to be invited. And he wants to be there early so that he can be invited in so that he can get the king's permission to have Mordecai hanged. This is so classic. Mordecai is there intending nothing but evil. Or Haman is there contending nothing but evil for Mordecai. You remember the story of Joseph back in Genesis? The classic verse, Genesis chapter 50, verse 20, where his brothers are gathered around and they're, they're afraid that Joseph is going to seek vengeance on them because of all the terrible things they did to him. And what does he say to them? He says, you intended it for evil, but God intended it for good. See, all those bad things that happened to Joseph, and I hope you're seeing some parallels between this whole story of Joseph and this story of Esther. All those bad things happened to Joseph so that he would be in the right place at the right time to save his entire family, which would become the nation of the Jews. All these things, these bad things that are, have happened to Mordecai up until now have happened so that he will be in the right place at the right time along with Esther to save the entire race of their people. God's invisible hand is upon us all. So Haman has this plan. He arrives early, he's happy about it, everything's going good. I'm going down there, I'm gonna uh, get this Mordecai guy and take him out. And you remember now, the only thing Mordecai had ever done was he refused to bow down to Haman. And Haman's pride that just couldn't abide that. 
So let's take a look at Haman. And I, I entitled this second point, Poetic Justice. And we'll cover the chapter 6 through 11, uh, or verses 6 through 11. So, the first thing we see in verse 6, So Haman came in, and the king said to him, What should be done to the man whom the king delights to honor? Wow! Haman is ecstatic. Because look what he, he tells us next. It says in his little thought mind, Haman thinks, well, who would the king want to honor more than me? The king loves me. He parties with me. He, he takes my advice. He allows me to issue decrees in his name. Can you imagine? Oh, Haman says, I got it all going my way. How ironic now what happens next. Watch, watch this. And Haman said to himself, Whom would the king delight to honor more than me? And Haman said to the king, For the man whom the king delights to honor, let royal robes be brought, which the king has worn, and the horse that the king has ridden, and on whose head a royal crown is set, and let the robes and the horse be handed over to one of the king's most noble officials. Let them dress the man whom the king delights to honor, and let them lead him on the horse through the square of the city, proclaiming before him, Thus shall be done to the man whom the king delights to honor. Hmm. Isn't it ironic? that Haman unknowingly prescribes the manner the man he hated and came to kill would be honored. And this brings us to another little coincidence. Why is it the king said to Haman, what should be done for the man the king wants to honor? Why didn't the king say, what shall be done for Mordecai? We don't know. It's just coincidental that instead of using Mordecai's name, he says the man who the king would honor. Contrast Mordecai and Haman. We talked a little bit about it at the very beginning. Mordecai had led this life of quiet desperation as we've talked about it. He just did the right thing every day. It wasn't very exciting. He wasn't going anywhere. He just got up every day and went to work and did the best he could do. And by the way, I've known a lot of people like that in my lifetime, and I admire them greatly. When, when I was young, a youngster, I worked in the sawmills a lot. And... Uh, there were guys in those sawmills that had been there 20, 30 years, and they're doing some mundane job, pull a board off, put it over here, pull a board off, put it over here, eight hours a day, five days a week. You know, and they'd been there 20 or 30 years. And you think, yuck. But you know, the, the thing that impresses me about those guys is they probably didn't like that job either, but they had a responsibility to take care of their families, and that was the only way they knew how to do it. And they got up every day, and they went and they did it. And, and that just impressed me. Um, so the fact that we may live, I, I hope we don't necessarily, but some of us may, live mundane lives where we just get up every day and put one foot ahead of the other to support our families. That's an honorable thing. And so, uh, don't be the least bit ashamed of that. And that's where Mordecai was. He was an honorable man, but it just didn't look like he was going anywhere. And then on the other hand, we have Haman, and as we said, he's on the fast track to success. He's got it all going on. Now, if we, based on the circumstances, Haman's assumption was not an unreasonable one. Who would the king delight to honor? Haman. Makes sense. Because from the circumstances, it looked like that was the way to go. And one of the things we wrestle with a lot in the, the morning men's group as we go through our, our various Bible studies and that is, is how that you cannot tell who God is blessing by looking at their circumstances. You see. 
And, and we tend to do that because we're human. And we say, oh, God's really blessing so-and-so because the, they're really financially prospering or whatever. Or, or God must really be upset with so-and-so because no matter how hard they try, it seems like nothing goes right for them. Well, we don't know. That's why Scripture admonishes us that we're not supposed to judge the kinds of things we don't know. See? It looked like Haman was God's favorite. And yet, God had nothing to do with Haman. Haman had plenty of money. He had plenty of power. What he craved was to be honored. Remember, that's why he says, I want to wear the king's robe. I want to wear the king's crown. I want to wear, ride the king's horse. I want somebody to parade me through town and crying out to everybody how wonderful I am. Because you cannot buy respect. See, no matter how much money you have, no matter how much power you have, you cannot buy the people's respect. And that's the one thing Haman was lacking. Well, let's look at verses 8 and 9. Let royal robes be brought, which the king has worn. Let the horse that the king has ridden. Let the crown that the, the king has set. And let the robes and the horses be handed over to one of the king's most noble officials. Let them dress the man and the king delights to honor. And let them lead him on the horse through the square of the city, proclaiming before him, Thus shall it be to done to the man whom the king delights to honor. Well, how cool is that? That's... <coughs> Just doesn't get any better than that for Haman. He's got it made. But then, like a dagger to the heart, Haman hears the words of verse 10. Then the king said to Haman, Hurry, take the robes and the horse as you have said, and do so to Mordecai the Jew. Now, don't you know, Haman is just... <laughs> How can this be? How can this be? Mordecai the Jew? I hate Mordecai the Jew. And everyone in town knows it. And they all know I was going to put Mordecai the Jew in his place. And now I have to personally parade through town telling everybody how wonderful he is? Oh, how quickly the worm turns. How can it be? You see, the ungodly also live their lives in the shadow of the gallows. Poor Haman. Imagine how this must have galled him. He sought to be honored and he received humiliation. He sought to be honored and he received humiliation. You know, Peter tells us to humble ourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God. And at the proper time, He, God, will exalt us. Isn't it, isn't it coincidental how that works? The man that seeks to be honored is humiliated. The man who seeks to just serve and do what has to be done day after day after day is honored. Quite a contrast. Now, just when you think it can't get any worse for Haman, it does. You remember sometimes people said, you know, it's, you're going through a hard time. They say, well, smile, it could be worse. And the guy says, yeah, I smiled, and sure enough, it got worse. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's what Haman is going to experience. Uh, you remember now, in back in chapter 5, uh, when, when he was upset because Mordecai wouldn't bow down to him, he went home and gathered his, his uh, advisors and, and his wife, and they built him up and told him how wonderful he was, and, and he went away happy. Well, now, he's paraded Mordecai through the streets. He's all defeated and upset again. Uh, a hundred times worse than before. So he says, I'm going to go home. I'm going to gather my friends and my wife and they're going to have the answer for me again and I'll be able to be a happy man once again. So we'll pick it up at verse 12. Then Mordecai returned to the king's gate. 
But Haman hurried to his house, mourning and with his head covered. And Haman told his wife Zeresh and all his friends everything that had happened to him. Then his wise men and his wife Zeresh said to him, If Mordecai, before whom you have begun to fall, is of the Jewish people, you will not overcome him, but will surely fall before him. Wow. Haman must be mortified. As I say, you remember in chapter 5, he came to the same group of folks and they told him how wonderful he was and how he was going to succeed. And now they say, you're going to die, boy. If, if you go against Mordecai, you're going to lose. They've done a complete 180. What happened? Well, what happens is, you know, we've talked a lot about the kinds of advisors you surround yourself with. And we all have advisors. You know, they may not have an official capacity, but we have those one or two or five friends or whatever that we uh, go to when we have, or I hope we do anyway, uh, that, that will tell us the straight story, you know. And we've talked about the folly of surrounding yourself with a bunch of yes men or yes women, as the case may be. And that is what Haman had done, you see. And they always told him just what they wanted, just what he wanted to hear. But these kinds of folks are your friends as long as things are going well. When things start to go south, as they are obviously for Haman, I mean, they, they saw him parading through the streets. They knew that he'd fallen out of favor. And so they turn on him. They're too bad. My, my dad used to call them fair-weather friends. You know, he said, they're your friends as long as you got, they're talking to me, you know, as long, as long as you got gas money and that sort of thing, they're your friends. But as soon as you're broke, they're gone. You know, that's the way Haman's advisors were. Finally, Haman gets a bit of good news, though. Verse 14. While they were yet talking with him, the king's eunuchs arrived and hurried to bring Haman to the feast that Esther had prepared. Now Haman has now, he's got to think, oh, maybe there's a light at the end of the tunnel because that's right, Esther had invited the king and I to this second feast and I'm still invited. Whoopee! <laughs> And, you know, it, it, we should take just a moment to, to look at what Mordecai did, how he responded to all the accolades and all the honors. You know, I can see where Mordecai might have been tempted uh, to do something like, you know, I'm up on this horse and you're down there and, you know, how do you like it now? And uh, maybe I'm going to go to the king and maybe we're going to reverse things here a little bit. Maybe I'll have you hung on that gallows. But he didn't do any of that, did he? When the little parade was over, Mordecai returned to the king's gate, i.e. his place of work. He went back to living his life. He didn't say, hey, now I'm something special. He just took it as a blessing and went right back to what he perceived that he needed to do. So what can we learn from all this? First, whether we can see it or not, God's invisible hand is at work in our lives. We tend to think God is working in our lives when things are going good. And he's not working in our lives when things aren't. The truth of the matter is he is always working in our lives. He's, he's pushing us. He's uh, nudging us. He's moving things around to get us where he wants us to be. So Romans 8.28 is applicable. I, I heard a sermon a while back where you, the guy said that uh, you, you shouldn't be quoting that verse to people that are struggling, but I, I would take just the opposite stance. You should. Because, you know, it, it says God causes all things to work together for good. It doesn't say God causes all good things. He causes all things. Bad things, good things. All of them work together for our ultimate good 
at some point. Now we may have to wait a while to get to that point, and I don't like that process any more than you do. But that's what's happening. So that's the first thing. The second is this. We all live in the shadow of the gallows, believer and unbeliever alike. No matter how good or how bad things are going, it can all change in the twinkling of an eye. You know, you, you've planned, you've worked, you, you've invested, you've done all the right things. You know, you're 50 years old and you're ready to retire. And you don't feel good one day. And you go to the doctor and he says, you've got six months to live. Everything changes in a twinkling of an eye. You see? Or it can go the other way too. You can think, you know, you're going nowhere, nothing good's ever going to come of this, and boom, in the twinkling of an eye, God can change it all. Haman had it all. He had fame, wealth, position, yet in the space of less than 24 hours, he was disgraced and executed. Now, we'll get to the execution. Mordecai was scheduled to be hanged on the gallows built out of hate and pride, completely overlooked for his historic deed. And yet, one night the king couldn't sleep and that whole thing changed. Finally, there's coming a day when all will be made right. We struggle with that thing now. Why do the righteous suffer? I don't know. Is that the theological answer with three degrees and all that years and all that money and the best answer I can come up with for you is I don't know. <laughs> That's God's business. I don't know. But there's coming a day when all will be made right and the righteous will no longer suffer. When history as we know it will come to an end. Sin and sorrow will be destroyed and righteousness will be exalted. And every knee will bow and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. Let me read that for you. And, and all this comes about, this whole day that's coming, comes about because one man humbled himself. Let me, let me read it for you. It's in, in Philippians, it's chapter 2. It says this, starting in verse 5. Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who, Jesus, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but made himself nothing, taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men, and being found in human form, now here it is, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God has highly exalted him and bestowed upon him a name which is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. If that one man wouldn't have humbled himself, we would be wasting our time here now. You know? So think about it, guys, ladies. Maybe we just need to humble ourselves a little bit. And you know, humility isn't an, oh, I'm a worm type of thing. No, not at all. It's just having a proper perspective on who we are in light of who God is. And if we humble ourselves a little bit, He is going to exalt us. He promises, says so. So, there we are, we leave our two protagonists, and the situation's still iffy, isn't it? Uh, Mordecai, things look like they're a little better for him, but who knows, Haman's off to a feast with the king, maybe the worm will turn again by next week. We'll just have to wait and see. Pray with me. Father, thank you that you love us and care for us and that you do cause all things to work together ultimately for our good. And thank you, Lord, that you came to this earth and you humbled yourself and died on a cross that we could have everlasting life and that you reach out to us now and you tell us that whosoever will put their faith in you can have eternal life. 
And so, Lord, if there's anyone here this morning that doesn't know you as their Lord and Savior, I would just encourage them to, just in the quietness of their heart, reach out to you and say, Jesus, I want you to be my Savior. I believe in you. And know that instantly it's done. It can never be revoked, never be changed. And so, Lord, we understand that that doesn't mean that we will live a life of ease and never have any problems. That will come after our life is over on this earth. Until then, we live in a fallen world. But it is so good to know that we can come to you in times of trouble and distress and come boldly and receive mercy and grace. So all we can say is humbly thank you. And we pray in your name, Jesus. Amen.